Welcome to the Growing Up Bananas podcast, where we dissect the perks and tribulations of being bananas. It's hard being yellow when I feel so white. My name is Ethan. Sam sits next to me for now. And in many ways, I sit next to him. Last episode, we caught up with Jamie and got a great insight into his life as a halfy half Asian, half Caucasian. This episode, we are discussing community involvement and we're very honored to have Gerard join us later. Let's get into it. So from the outset, growing up in South Africa with segregation and apartheid and all that, the communities, especially the minorities, I believe were pretty tightly knit. You had, uh, specifically for us, I spoke about in a previous pod, the Chinese Association, they had this um, national tournament that they used to come together for every Easter and obviously in between they used to have other associations so sport and religion were the two main ones Um, I guess sport and religion go hand in hand sometimes one in the same in certain countries so as we spoke about before why would you think the commonality of sport and religion draws people together because there's fanatics Um, obviously with religion it's very it's a very polarizing topic. So you're gonna have people that are very committed or just you know, on the opposite side and have so don't it's like feel politics anything. as well. It's yeah. more religion politics, the main division or the main things that divide people, but also the main thing that bring people together. So mm. yeah, so growing up in terms of community involvement, those were the two main um, I guess categories that brought Act- people together. And activities that were participated in. So if I look at from a religious perspective, because my family is quite, quite religious, quite devout um, in the Catholic community, we always, you know, we went, we went to church every week. We were involved in a lot of the fundraising and the community events with the church. Mm. And that was kind of the main thing that we had growing up. Yeah, I think we were the same. We went, uh, when the moment we got, from the Gold, got here to the Gold Coast from Sydney, I think the first thing they did was, you know, sussed out a church and then made a lot of friends from there. And I think um, especially in migrant communities, it's a way of spreading your seeds or sowing the seeds. Sowing the seeds. (laughs) If you join a religious community, you're always going to be accepted no matter what. So you kind of know, I don't want to say it's a bit of a low-hanging fruit that you know you're going to have acceptance and you're going to have the common... um, common mindset and common interest of religion. So did you feel growing up any pressure to kind of participate or join that community? Well, I didn't really have a choice. So I had to go every week as a as a minor, almost. We stopped going for a few years. I can't remember the reason why. I think mum and dad just getting flogged with work. But I think for the most part, when we did have Sundays available, we were at church um, and yeah, it was really good. We made a lot of lifelong friends there. My parents, I guess that was one of their ways of socializing. Um, they didn't socialize too much. But when they went to church, it was like eating food together. Um, you know, we got to play around as kids. And I'm still friends with a lot of the guys that we met at church way back in the day. Yeah, that's good. I mean, you got Dami Yim, friend of the show, um, in the church as well. So you, you're always going to meet a lot of good people and I say good because mm, yeah you know good people also don't go to church but you're going to meet people who have a similar mindset I think so coming from South Africa to Australia one thing that I noticed in terms of community Australia is very philanthropic um, generous and very charity driven mm. I think it is always a lot easier to be that way when you have more and Australia is very lucky wealthy country so most people are always happy to give back um, in, a, in any way that they can in your family, have you have you guys always tried to you know be involved in, in charities and sort of giving back? I think it's more so it depends on what the cause is. Um, like obviously here we've got infinite things that we can sort of give back to. There's so many charities in Australia, that's one thing. Yeah, mum and dad were, I guess, charitable with certain things. What sort of stuff do you like to get involved in? Because I know you, you made a good point before where you say you can't put your time and your resources to everything. It's never going to be enough. Hmm. What are some of the things that are important to you? Uh, the things that I'm passionate about is children from underprivileged places or not 
or lower socioeconomic places, ones that don't have, you know, the same opportunity as other people. Um, I did, I was, before I hurt my knee, I was doing some volunteering for an organization, but that has faded over time. You're not physically able anymore. What about you? Yeah, so if I if I look at my parents gave us, I'm talking about my brothers and I, a really good example of trying to give back as much as you can. Again, your point is well taken. You can't, you know, there's got to be a point and there's got to be some certain um, projects or initiatives that you do support. Hmm. So my mom and dad have always been really good and um, try to show us or lead the way in, in terms of trying to be generous with what you have because... You know, we, we've always had the example given to us where you have these billionaires who give a million bucks and some people just laugh at it, oh, you know, it's 2% of their wealth or whatever it is, not yeah. even that. Point is they're still giving it and mm. they don't have to. So if you give something of yourself, it's always going to be better than nothing. Is there one particular example that sticks out with the parentals? Um, not really. I think going to church every week, they always used to give nice colorful notes and i would always be like what what are we doing and i'd always question it and be like you know i could go to me i could buy some more video games or something oh hell yeah but um at the end of the day it's it's something that's important to them which is religion and they're fortunately able to to give that and it's something that they really wanted to to support which is the church so probably that's probably the biggest one for me um when you were at church, do you feel that your parents went strictly for God or was it? were there other parts for it? Other parts? I, I can't speak for them, but I, th- I think there's always um, multi-factors involved in doing anything. Yeah. I'd say their spirituality and their own internal you know, religious beliefs and practices was, was the main driver. Other ones probably, to, get, to give an example for us as kids. Mm. Um, and then also, I think most people do enjoy the community. Mm. the involvement um, back to our topic. So probably a few different factors, but in my opinion, I'd say mainly for, for the spirituality and just being a good example for others. Yeah, so for my for my dad, I'll speak. I'm going to throw him a bit under the bus there, but <laughs> <laughs> he used to always, you know, engage in prayer during the sermon, so he'd look like this. <laughs> and then he'd come alive after the sermon, which is always funny to see. <laughs> Very deeply engaged, very um, thought, thought-provoking. Mm, but yeah, I, I've done that a few times. <laughs> I think, yeah, I guess the point I'm trying to make there is that it's, sometimes it's yeah purely for community engagement, not for other reasons. Yeah. And that's the thing. Look, who's who's to judge? I mean, who? there's always multiple reasons why people do stuff. It might be for the optics. I think a lot of generosity probably does come just from optics. 100%. I think so as well. But at the end of the day, it's if you're, giving, you're still giving, giving something, yeah. so making a difference. Um, the last thing I'd probably touch on is, so my grandmother, um, amazing woman, she had nine kids, and yeah. we can probably get into the, her story another time, but she was largely illiterate, um, couldn't read or write, but such a wise woman. And she would always tell my mum and I guess her siblings, you have to give to take such a simple and sort of broken down phrase, but it's so true. What does it mean, give to take? So if you want to be able to receive or if you want to be able to... And receive is not just in monetary or physical things. It's it's everything. It's in kindness. It's in thoughts and prayers and, and everything like that. Mm. you got to be able to give first and, you know, the rest will come. So that's something that I've always tried to live by. And hopefully mom and dad's... Uh, and my, my grandmother's words have, have bled through. I'm excited to see where this conversation goes. It's too easy. Great. So we've got uh, Gerard coming on next. Um, it's going to be really, really insightful. And I think it's a very special special guest for us. Just it's some, something a little bit different to what we, we've had previously. And hopefully he can you know, give some, some guidance for, for those out there who might be in a similar position. So really lucky today to have Gerard uh, come and join us. We know him through the Church St. Peter's in Rochdale. Um, extremely, extremely grateful to have him here. Not only is he a role model in the community, but he's actually going to be a priest in about a year's time. So very honoured to firstly know him, secondly for him to come here. How are you, Gerard? Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm really good, thanks. Yeah, That's good. It's been a big day, but not excited <laughs> to be on the show. Yeah, thanks yeah. very much for putting some time aside yeah, for no us. 
So, Dry, tell us a little bit about your background. So, uh, my parents are both from Malaysia. Uh, dad's from Kuala Lumpur, mum's from Port Dixon. Uh, and probably going back to my great grandparents, they're from Guangzhou in China. So, Malaysian Chinese in, in heritage. Okay. And um, siblings? Yeah, I've got two sisters, an older sister and a younger sister. Right. So, you're right in the middle there? Yeah, middle. Middle only boy. Oh, good. <laughs> so, I guess in sticking with our podcast, um, we've had this question so many times over the years. Where are you actually from? Like Sam would probably tell them I'm from Australia, Sydney. Um, we know that's not the question or that's not the answer that people want. Um, yeah. Have you ever had that question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, a lot or quite a few times. Or I like to say it to my other fellow Asian friends as well what sort of Asian are you yeah, but yeah. like if it's an Aussie person asking that is yeah what what they actually are meaning is like sort of what's your cultural heritage or what's your background yeah I've had that a few times for sure so you're a good guy oh. you usually make it well speaking for myself I usually make it really awkward and just say I'm from Australia and then we go from where there. <laughs> uh, Brisbane <laughs> no 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 where uh south side <laughs> oh i see <laughs> no nah, it's I, i've done that as well but yeah you're straight to the point and then you say it's a chinese malaysian and then australian yeah that's right yeah. yeah so i say i'm born here in australia born in sydney but mum and dad are from malaysia yeah nice i was born in sydney as well hey, cool. everyone wants to come up i think it's the weather <laughs> definitely the weather yeah weather and the lifestyle it's way more relaxed and chill here i find yeah so when did you, did you, uh, what age did you move from Sydney? Um, I was a baby. So I turned one when we moved into our house in, okay. in Brisbane. Yeah. So straight, straight to Brisbane. And yes. And you've been here since? Yeah. So oh, geez. Yeah. I didn't really have a choice in it. It sounded like I was like, yeah, it's way more relaxed, but I was a baby. I had no idea, but <laughs> that's just what my parents said. And going back to visit, you know, rallies in Sydney. Yeah. The pace is much slower. You walk down the footpath and, and people say hi to you uh, compared to Sydney where it's a bit more fast paced, more honking, more road rage, more, um, you know, stress and busy people. And we'll probably touch on this a little bit later. Can you speak any other languages besides English? Yeah, I can speak a little bit of Cantonese and a little bit of Mandarin. My Cantonese is a bit better than my Mandarin. And is that learned through like external school parents? So I grew up my parents wanted us to, you know, sp know more of our background, so speak Cantonese at home, and then it sort of turned into, you know, Chinglish, Chinese English, um, <laughs> yep. um, Canto English. Uh, and then Mandarin, it was really hard, so we had to learn in Saturday Chinese classes uh, at a local um, Zhongtian temple just down the road here. Um, so three hours every Saturday, which I think we pretty much hated, but... Um, I did it, I don't know, at least 10 years probably from like, you know, grade three to grade... Right. You, you definitely stuck it out much longer yeah. than we did. We've yeah. got some funny stories about Chinese school and Korean school. Yeah, yeah. Um, seems like it was quite a fun time back then. Um, I guess, have you ever felt like an outcast because of the race in Australia? Not sometimes, but not really. I kind of don't really have to think about it anymore. Um if I do notice it, I'm just like, oh, look, it's the Asians are sitting there and the white people are sitting there sort of thing. I, I do, you know, I would sort of gravitate towards m my people, like Asian people. If if there's like a big crowd of strangers, I'd, I'd feel maybe more at home to approach yep. the, the Asian guy or girl or whatever. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd, I, I, I feel quite at home in Australia and everything yeah that's good and i guess to dive a little bit deeper it probably speaks to your family the environment that you were brought up in that race wasn't really a factor yeah i'd say so so my parents moved like migrated here when they were quite young so i'm pretty sure dad was in primary school yeah and mum was university student so they yeah they came much younger and so australian culture and life was incorporated or well, western culture was um, incorporated more into their life and so they kind of you know have more of an australian accent and integrated better and that for therefore it kind of translated over to us as well yeah so in terms of upbringing like obviously you had those things like 
Asian school and did you do like Kumon or any of those types of things? No, actually, surprisingly. No, we didn't do, um, what would you call it? Extra, like extra, extra curriculars. academic yeah, okay. studies. Um, so were they, tra- so were they more traditional in, like, were they, did they give you more Asian values or did they try, were they more Australian in the way that they brought you up? They were a bit of both, but I'd say they were more sort of relaxed Asians or um, relaxed, they were yeah. kind of a bit more integrated in the Chinese culture. So, you know, family is a big part of Chinese culture. Um, having meals together, it's kind of saving money, yeah. um, working, <laughs> doing chores at home, um, you know, getting spanked as a kid. Um, that's like pretty stock standard but other stuff like oh yeah strict as in mm, they were kind of strict like um you know uh you know be home at this certain time or you can only go out like once every two weeks or something they some somehow counted i'm not sure um <laughs> that sort of thing um but in terms of yeah culture stuff yeah they weren't they weren't like the strict asian parents where they they didn't they they always said try hardest but they didn't say, look, I want you to be a doctor or a lawyer or anything. Yeah. Um, yeah, they were very, they just said, make sure you do something that you love in the future. And um, we love you no matter what. Just make sure you, you know, you make the most of your opportunities and you try your best. So were they very verbal in terms of their support? Or you is it something that was just felt? Because we were talking um, about it before. It's a lot, of, a lot of the Asian parents, especially ones that weren't necessarily born or brought up, in a, in a Western country, we find that the the support and the way they show the love is sometimes verbal. So they tell you how much they love you. Yeah. Some will show you. My parents personally, they physically kiss and hug and that's their way of showing it as well as the words of affirmation. Mm-hmm. Um, your parents, how did they sort of show their support for you guys? They showed it through, I'd say it was... Less so verbally, probably more so um, acts of service, that sort of thing. Mm. Um, I haven't really thought of it, but I I always felt like, yeah, yeah, they sort of you know kiss you, um, kiss you good night, that sort of thing. So they um, were quite affectionate. Yeah, yeah, we were sort of touchy feely um, family. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's know, all good. That sort of thing. Um, yeah. A huggy family, um, but. Yeah, yeah, they they were verbal, but so they, it wasn't like no, no communication of hey we love you and we appreciate you. But um, I'd say it was more sort of acts of service and look, um, look, I'm cooking for you. That shows me that shows that I love you. Or um, I'm taking you to school. That shows that I love you. Yeah, um, I, probably more pri- primarily. I think that's similar to your parents, wasn't it? Yeah, Where you you kind of knew in the background the time that they spend with you. The yeah, you know, it's definitely in the. Like as you get older, you realize it. But when you're young, it's just like, oh yeah, I'm just living my life. But you come to appreciate that a lot more. So in terms of food, customs, things like that, sorry. Um, have you guys held on to much of the Chinese Malaysian culture? You guys enjoy the Chinese food and, and all that at home? So mum's a really good cook. Uh, so one thing that's pretty stock standard is mum boils her own broth and makes soup every pretty much every night. Oh. Um, so we have in Cantonese ching tong, which is like, you know, um, clear soup or, and then she just, um, adds in, you know, either like pork bones or, um, seafood or, or vegetables or something. So that's like stock standard soup every night. And then there's rice or some sort of stir fry or some sort of other thing. But every now and then, you know, it gets mixed in with, um, some pastas or something. Yeah. It might be a pasta, it might be some sort of spaghetti or a, uh, a lasagna or a steak or a meat pie um, but mostly Asian cuisine uh, growing up yeah so mum was very gifted and sometimes you know she being a foodie she was sort of craved stuff so or dad craved stuff so she made like chao kui diao which is like the Malaysian stir fry noodles or pad, pad thai um, and then there's also the curry puffs that mum's really good at making and she she's pretty good at desserts too um, so yeah, we we had a, a nicer range of array of things. Yeah, nice. We look forward to the invitations. <laughs> <laughs> I've been fortunate enough to um, have a few dinners with your parents, and it's yeah. always been lovely. They 
definitely foodies. They enjoy the food, so it's it's always good to speak to them. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess before we move on, Gerard, in terms of um, your parents, so we had a chat the other night and we were talking about how a lot of the recipes and some of the customs are probably going to die with them. I don't want to use those words, but it, it's pretty true. Um, do you feel that with you, obviously with the journey you're going on, but more probably so for your sisters, is the Chinese Malaysian culture, is it going to sort of stop there? Yeah, good point. I guess the more you you live in a, a different sort of culture, the more you might leave the previous generations behind or the previous culture you had behind. So, you know, we live in Australia uh, where our heritage is Malaysian Chinese, so we might lose, slowly lose as the generations go on um, that Malaysian Chinese culture. But I'd say, you know, the internet's your best friend if you feel like making a, a, I don't know, a bubble tea or a, <laughs> some sort of queer, some sort of Asian dessert. You can always find it on the internet. But to answer your question, yeah, maybe I'd say some things do get lost and mum has to dig it up in um, her recipe book or she says, oh, yeah, my grandma or my or my mum or my great-grandma used to make it. She was really good at it, but I'm no good. So even sort of that, you can hear it slowly getting lost already. Yeah. Mm. It's a bit of a shame because, yeah, there's so many good recipes. I mean, I even talked to my mother-in-law and she's always like, oh, you know, it's in my head. I can't write it down. It's like, well, it's it's literally going to be lost when you... Um, move on which which really sucks um and obviously a lot of customs and things like that when it comes to weddings and whatever it might be ah, yes. um, funerals and we we don't know it so it's it sort of goes there is there one asian thing that you'll hold on to for the rest and try to pass on um when you said that um, the first thing i was like hong bao yes give us the money um, <laughs> <laughs> always um no yeah, um it's a good answer <laughs> One that I'll hold on to, whew, all I can think of is, is food right now. Um, so I'd, I'd love like the Chinese chow kui diao, which is the yeah, that's Malaysian my favorite version dish. of you know, well. pad thai. Um, I'll always hold on to that. But in terms of cultural stuff, like um, I love how we're family oriented so or people oriented. So always going back to family for birthdays and anniversaries and special occasions. I, I do like holding on to that and just the gift of time together is is important yeah so earlier you mentioned that you did you did some language school at a temple what kind of temple was that it was a buddhist temple uh called jong tian sure is that the one in underwood is, yeah the one in underwood oh yeah we yeah. go there every year for the, lunar new year's the temple oh, yeah it's not chinese yeah, lunar, it's lunar. lunar new year. and they do like light li- yeah yeah you got the line dancing and all that <laughs> Uh, you guys are so cultural. I, I am. I really. No, it's because of Alex. So cultured. Um, <laughs> so did you, were your parents Buddhists growing up? No, so we're Catholic. We're Roman Catholic, um, Christian. Yep. Okay, sweet. So the language school just happened to be there? Yeah, it just so happened to be at this Buddhist temple and there was like classrooms around on the back in demountable uh, classrooms and then it was just taught by these um it was taught with these textbooks from taiwan and i think taiwanese teachers so we instead of learning uh simplified we learned traditional Thai, uh, chinese oh, uh, mandarin with um you know uh what is it called zhu ying and stuff like that which is um the extra kanji the extra spelling on the side yeah. extra compl- complexity yes like nice <laughs> sweet so your parents were obviously a little bit accepting of everything um, when did you find out that you wanted to be a priest? Would have been... What was your journey, your emotional journey? Yeah, it would have been probably 19. I thought about it seriously. Yeah. Uh, whew, my story would have been, you know, grew up believing in God, went to, you know, Catholic schools and, and prayed before um, meals every night and prayed before bedtime as a family. You know, you just go around in a circle, say some intercessions and then say some, you know, set prayers like the Our Father and the Hail Mary uh, and the Glory Be. And then the extent was, you know, going to church on the weekend, so going to church on Sunday. And I started altar serving in high school 
Um, and I found that helped me, you know, stay focused and stay awake because I was, you know, sitting at the front and had a job to do, had something to do. <laughs> um, and then in after sort of year 11 or year 12, I was just trying to figure out what I wanted to do. But school was getting pretty hard. So I was like, OK, I don't want to go straight into uni. Um, I've had enough. I've had 12 years of education. Let's have Fair a break. Enough. Let's have a gap year. And this retreat came up where these cool young people, they just ran this retreat um, and they had a faith and they were doing something about it. And I remember going home, uh, writing down everything that we did. They just did like, you know, skits and dramas and small group activities and, uh, you know, shared their story. And it was just really powerful. And I, and I just, I don't know, I just really, really enjoyed it. And I thought, Maybe I should just take a gap year and do what they're doing. Go what, around to different schools. What was the group, Gerard? It was called Net Ministry, so the okay. National Evangelization Teams. And, yeah, they just go around Australia or there's lots of teams around the world like Canada, USA, Uganda, uh, New Zealand, and they run retreats for different high schools and RE classes and stuff. You mentioned powerful. Um, what In what context did you mean powerful? Powerful as in, well, there was this one activity. It was kind of like a forgiveness activity where you, it was all silence. You had your head on the desk sort of thing and you had to go, when when the leaders tapped you on the shoulder, you had to go up to someone else and tap them on the shoulder, either give them a high five, a handshake or a hug. And I think that just really brought our year level closer together because there was just so much, you know, in fight, not in fighting, but just conflict or clicks and that sort of thing. And and sometimes it's just those non nonverbal reconciliation that you need to have with people. And you know, I, I just found that that one activity was really powerful, um, and a few other things. Just getting to know your peers in a different setting, maybe sh- sharing a little bit deeper than you normally share. Just was just really yeah powerful was had an impact on me that I it was hard to explain but I guess looking back it was sort of like I learned more about Jesus through people yeah because I went to a Catholic primary and high school but we had a similar it wasn't the net team but we had a similar team come around and one of the exercises was that except you had to actually um get up and say something to someone who you've either hurt or someone who you've just haven't said something about in the whole sort of grade forum. And that was extremely emotional. You had some people who apologized to friends that they'd sort of unfriended for the past five years. And, you know, I'm sorry, life got in the way, you know, I still love you and all this stuff. And it was talk about powerful, like you're getting in front of your whole grade and people are apologizing and talking um, to on that extent or that level. Um, yeah, so I can so I can kind of relate. We didn't go down the same path, but I definitely felt something similar when I went through that um, during school. Um, so my question then, as you're speaking, I didn't want to cut you off. So growing up, um, obviously from a fairly devout family, did you have any thoughts about being a priest um, growing up? Because if I take a step back, we in South Africa, my two brothers Alta served as well. Yep. My oldest brother, I think if we didn't come to Australia, he very well would be a priest now. Um, I think we had this chat one time when you were over. And it seems to be, yeah, it's kind of, it's a pathway a lot of kids see themselves on when they're young because they probably don't understand what it encompasses the whole way. Was there any time when you were younger that you thought I could potentially go down this pathway? Well, as a kid, you, you typically mimic what you see so I think you know when I was grade one or maybe even younger like five or six just standing at the back of the church um standing in either the you know on the pews or in the middle of the aisle or whatever just like mimicking the priest like standing up and (laughs) break the host yeah breaking the host uh that sort of thing but I didn't it didn't really cross my mind I always thought oh those other kids they're way more holier or just better than me good for them they'll be they'll be priests one day or something it never really crossed my mind until you know 18 19 when after i did this youth ministry thing i deepened my faith through that and it made me realize you know it's not automatic that you do what the world tells you that you 
get married, have kids, get a house, everything else, that you can serve the world and serve the church in different ways. You can, you know, be a religious brother. You could be a religious sister. You can be a single person. You can be a priest. Um, so I didn't want to, you know, get to the end of my life and have never thought about those things. And I think, you know, as a good Christian man, a uh, good Catholic man, you just, you might as well think about these things. Not Even if it's just for like one day or one week, you might as well give that time to, devote that time to think about it so that's what i did and it i guess it never really went away long story short yeah no sam had a really good question that we spoke about beforehand where it was about um do you remember you spoke about it, it was like what does Gerard bring to the table do you remember how you yeah so um like i thought when i was 15 16 i went through that stage as well i think i was going through year 12 um when i was thinking about career choices do I want to like I'd wanted to be an accountant since I was about 10 years old and then aiming high <laughs> and like when I got to grade 12 I was going to to youth as well and I had a really sick pastor as well similar to you he was youthful he had like real good energy um love the man uh but in terms of like your religion and if you were ministering, what do you think that you bring that's different that will serve the cause? I think that will bring... What do you think you different. bring? Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I really liked it. One of the few. I'm not sure if it'll be different, but I guess it'll just be my personally personality coming through, which is you know just sharing my story, sharing the power and love of... Christ in my life and how I you know I was I th- I was lost or I knew there was something out there but I didn't know what it quite was and through you know a an encounter at reconciliation where I told the priest uh my sins and he forgive me of my sins when I you know was reflecting on that and as I was walking back to my seat I felt you know honestly forgiven and, and peaceful and sort of just this inner contentment and you know it definitely one didn't come from me I couldn't have generated it myself and two it like it just it just clicked it just made sense that this Jesus guy maybe he wasn't just an old guy that lived 2000 years ago and maybe everything that you know we learned in religion class and uh, church and stuff maybe it was true and then going deeper into that realized that you know he was the missing puzzle piece or he is the real deal mm, for me yeah so if you it's about replicating the forgiveness that you felt from that priest onto other people yeah yeah forgiveness love mercy just be a decent human yeah yeah mm. show the love and um goodness of god i rate that and i reckon ethan and i could learn a lesson or two from oh, you yeah. <laughs> nah, you're good, good fellas <laughs> oh, i don't know about this guy um, <laughs> we spoke about it before briefly off camera so um you're saying you know growing up probably more from a cultural or a you know obedience perspective in terms of girls you there was an expectation that that was you know after school you don't want to sort of waste your time with that can you think of any or even if you want to talk about that can you think of any other examples where maybe you've made a, a conscious or an unconscious decision that's now put you on the pathway um, that you're on? The thing I can think of is, which I sort of take to heart, is just whatever you do, um, put 100% into it. And I've always liked that work ethic because, you know, if you you don't know the upper limits, you don't know how hard you can try. You don't know how good you can be unless you really push yourself. Um, and, and I asked my parents, you know, why, where does that come from? Why, why, you know, why is it that typically um, Asians are, are smarter or whatever? Um, but they gave a good answer. And it's like, well, because there's so many billions of people living, let's just say in China, they have to, in order to stand out or in order to just get a job, they have to be the best of the best. Um, and work really hard and that's probably where our culture comes from where we have to work hard and and you know help our family in order to achieve or reach success 
um, and or get out of poverty or whatever. And and it's just flowed on from there. And it kind of it kind of makes sense, you know. You want to contribute to society. You want to try your best. So I, I try my best, but I also you know try to put in a little bit more as well. So if it's you know washing up whatever, and you see a random dish there and it's, you know, not the end of the day when you usually do the dishes, just help the person out and wash the dishes, that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. So that just that extra work ethic has then bled through to other areas of your life and sort of got you now to where, where you are a lot of hard work um, starting to, you know, get you towards where you, where you want to be, which is ultimately to, to be a priest. Yeah. I'd say um, they say that, you know, success is, one percent talent and ninety nine percent hard work, and I'm I, I I'm in no means you know successful, but I, I'd like to think that I, I I at least try hard at what I do, and and working hard means that you know you you learn from everything that you do. You you've done you've experienced more out of life than if you didn't work hard. Yeah, mm. that's, oh, that's good because it grinds my gears when people go, oh, I'm just chilling and. God will lead the way, but the reality is, is you've got to make that happen, and 100%. God will lead the way. So I think, yeah, that's really cool to hear that. It's the story you put um, on hard when work. the man's drowning, and then he prays to God, and he says, "God, come save me." So the guy comes on a boat. No, all good. God will save me. The guy comes in a helicopter. I don't need you. God will save me. He drowns. Goes to heaven. God, what happened? I sent the guy in the boat in the airplane or in the helicopter. Why didn't you get in with him? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's always one. a funny story. But yeah. so, so Gerard, I mean, you're not in my eyes a typical priest. You're young. Um, you know, you're a good-looking guy, well-educated. Um, some of the priests that I've had over the years uh, haven't been that. Let's just say, um, you know, you got your whole life ahead of you. We're roughly the same age. Um, we spoke. A little while ago, there were there were quite similar age guys in the seminary with you. Um, can you speak a little bit about that? Um, it's not sort of a pathway that we're seeing a lot of younger men go on. Um, is there anything you can talk to us about on that? Yeah, sure. So I'm from Holy Spirit Seminary at Banyo. So we're, we're a diocesan priesthood uh, and we're training to be priests for the diocese of... Um, all of Queensland. So there's five dioceses of Queensland uh, and Brisbane is one of them. There's 13 seminarians this year from, you know, first year to sixth year. There's six and a half years to become a priest. Um, a long time. And, <laughs> yeah, I didn't yeah. know it was that long. <laughs> yeah, so I'm in my That's final a lot of hard year, work, but yeah, no, year. Even more respect for the priest. Oh, there. cheers. Thanks, thanks. Um, and oh, the average age is, yeah, about... You know, 30, 31, 32. I think that's oh, the that's average age. So you're saying average, so this guy's younger. Yeah, yeah. Some There's like a guy that's 19 or 20. Yeah, oh, yeah. Um, and he's 60, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's about to finish. Yeah, sorry, yeah. carry on. So so it's a younger, average age is 30, so it's it's yeah. younger guys yeah. getting into priesthood. Well, it's, it's a mixture, but yeah, younger guys, I think... Well, first of all, because it's God's work... It's not, you know, hum- humankind. We're not creating it out of nothing. It's we're doing God's work, and 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 if God wants this to work, then you know, He will make it work somehow. Uh, so through you know the through God through the Holy Spirit, people hear uh, God's message, and then they're like, oh, I'm going to respond, or I think this is the way that I should live my life as a priest, and uh, they they do intentionally go into. Uh, uh, schools and speak at youth groups and things like that because it's it's so important we're just forgetting that priests are another occupation that people just aren't asking the question hey i think you'd make a good priest or i think you'd make a good brother or a good nun yeah we're just forgetting that these days and so just reminding people of those questions you know where am i going with my life what am i doing with my life and where does god fit in with everything i think they're great reflection questions um and potentially you might be called to be a priest or a nun or a brother or a sister and and that is that's fantastic and that's good but the fact that that question isn't being asked means that people aren't thinking about it so we're asking the question a bit more yeah sure before we move on to the next question so we we, we touched on the calling so you're at 19 this Mets team came they've changed your life really for, for the better 
Um, what was the next step? So that was a couple of years ago now. Mm. Um, you then decided, I want to pursue this journey. Um, what, what, what were the next steps um, from there? Yeah, so I took faith seriously and you know went to church off my own bat instead of going... And dragged every yeah, week by parents. Yeah, going nice. with my parents. So that was us. after then I could drive and stuff. So I sort of maybe explored different churches around the area instead of going to the yeah. home parish, that sort of thing. But what did it look like for me? Well, after that experience, I main, the main difference was just praying more. Like I I had a relationship with, with Jesus now and he wasn't just an old guy that lived ages ago. He was actually like a person that, you know, you can be best friends with and have a relationship with and uh, talk to, you can journal, you can pray, walk with everything. It's just, just like a best friend. And with any good relationship, you need to get to know the person. You need to get to know, you know, their family, the saints. You need to get to know uh, their history. So, you know, the Bible, you need to get to know, um, yeah, who they are and, and what they do. So that's through prayer and through everything else that comes with faith. So that's what I did, deepened my faith and, and prayer came with that and sacraments and mass. Also, I did want to get a bit of world experience as well. I didn't want to sort of jump straight into priesthood. And that was just playing on the back of my mind. It was just an option at that stage. It wasn't, um, oh, I'm really keen. I'm really certain on doing it. It was just an option at that stage. So I had deferred a Bachelor of Science and I went in to do that and I uh, completed that. Um, majoring in biology so I wanted to look into renewable energies and you know save the planet um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, that's always been keen uh, that's, I've always been keen on doing that you snore around good guy yeah <laughs> Jeez. Um, now, yeah. now you know saving the planet in different ways I guess saving souls or whatever yeah um, so yeah wanted to just get some experience under the belt um, and then is there like a selection process that you have to go through once you make that conscious decision that you want to be a priest yeah, well, there is a, yeah, there is a, a process and, you you know, you write a letter to the um, vocations office or the archbishop and um, there's, you know, there's an interviewing panel and there's a few, you know, tests that you have to do um, before you're accepted. Yeah. Yeah, and then that's that's about it. Well, because um, six, six and a half years, it, it's, I, I wonder if it's, I mean, obviously there's a lot of, psychology and learnings that you have to get under your belt so that's why you got to do it but i'm wondering if six and a half years is also to make sure that you are absolutely sure that this is what you want to do yeah of course and you know joining the seminary doesn't mean that you're set and that you're actually going to become a priest on the other side it's it's still a discernment process when you go into the seminary yeah um, and there's totally no shame in in when if you discern out of priesthood or if you decide to leave decide it's not for you um yeah six and a half years it's because you also study in-house subjects at the seminary but you also study um, a bachelor of theology and you end up doing a master's of theology yeah. as well that's a lot um, well qualified at the yeah, end yeah. yeah yeah and you you do a whole lot of prac as well i was gonna say that's longer than most <laughs> bachelor and master's degrees yeah. combined yeah. do you have any stats on the completion so once someone enters the seminary versus actually Becoming a priest? Yeah, so whew, off the top of my head, I'd say the last 10, 20 years completion rate is probably uh, three out of four. Okay. Well, that's yeah. dedication. Yeah, that's yeah. a lot. In, in Brisbane anyway, yeah, in Queensland. Yeah. So you reckon, well, you reckon that studying was one thing that you missed it, like that you wanted to do before you wanted to go into priesthood. Are there things that you look back and wish that you'd done on top of that so like any regrets or feel like you're going to miss out on certain elements to i guess i don't know like someone who as opposed to someone who's not going to priesthood no, oh, no, so, oh so for my for, for, example, for example me yeah. like i've gotten to my tender age of in 45. my 40, 40s 50s but um one thing that I regret not doing when I was younger was traveling a lot more. Uh -huh. um, and hopefully I get to do a little bit of that soon. But for yourself, um, are there things that you wish you had added or just like with uni, you felt like you needed to get that done? Are there things that you would wish you could have 
done before doing this? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know, little things like learning to drive a manual car or <laughs> <laughs> learning <laughs> a piano or something, which is probably easy, like learning the piano or something, like probably little things, but not really. Like I've been lucky enough to be able to travel travel and um, do a few things here and there. So, yeah, not really any regrets really, yeah. I guess the calling's so strong that, you know, things like having a family and all that, the, the path that you're on outweighs the idea of, of doing that. I think that's probably what I'm getting from it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it becomes integrated into it. So whatever I do do in the priesthood, I'll I'll probably learn or be able to do whatever, travel or um, get get experience with, um, what would you say, relationships and, and um, with people through through the priestly experiences, um, not necessarily married life. Yeah. yeah. Um, have you... Have you ever had any pressure from family or friends uh, to kind of talk you out of it? It's a bit of a it's a bit of an honest question, but if you Good don't question. want to answer, don't answer. Yeah, honestly, not really. Not that I can think of. I've been very blessed to have supportive parents and and siblings and things like that. Um, when I when I did tell my parents that I was thinking about priesthood, the answer. Or the re- reaction I got was pretty um, anticlimactic or nonchalant. Um, they were just like, "Oh, okay," and I was just thinking <laughs> that they would, you know, be like, "Oh, my son, um, wash your feet." <laughs> yeah, you know, "Oh, my son has figured out what he wants to do for the rest of his life," or "Oh, my son is gonna, you know, be a holy guy. That's great. He's not gonna, um, you know, be a drop kick or sell drugs <laughs> or anything." Yay, good. Um, but yeah, so it was a bit anticlimactic, but that's totally fine. I think it's, you know, you know it's grown on them um, and with my sisters and stuff. Um, yeah, I think that, yeah, they're pretty supportive about it. My younger sister did say, um, <laughs> she said, oh, you're really good with kids. Why don't you just be a teacher or something? <laughs> and I was just, yeah, but um, I think I will be a teacher in, in my capacity as a priest anyway. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, and I've, you know, thought about, yeah, when I was thinking about priesthood, I thought, you know, I feel like God was giving me the choice, whereas uh, where I could be, I would be a good uh, dad, but I'd also be, you know, a good father, a good priest. Um, and, you know, God was ultimately giving me the choice. And there's a few sort of factors, but one was um, I felt like God was calling me to the priesthood and that would be, you know, more fulfilling on my life. And I think, you know, I have like maybe too much um or maybe not too much love for one person but i'm able to dedicate not just my love and energy towards one person but towards the community the people of god who will be my extended family um the church and i think just from what i know of you um people were probably supportive because they knew you were the right kind of guy to do it I mean, if I went and told people I was going to be a priest, I don't think anyone would be too happy about that. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the kind of mold for a priest. So that's probably what it is, is people supported you and they were with you all the way because they knew the potential that you you probably had. So uh, I'm just assuming, but that's what I know of you. So hmm. Oh, thanks. Um, but yeah, but just to, you know, myth bust it as well, like, you know, um, priests come from any, any background and um, any... Uh, you know personality as well there's no you know one yeah. size fits all so um yeah if, if you're thinking about it test it out and see see where god's calling you um but yeah there's no set good guy bad guy like there's the whole discernment process there's a the whole panel there's there's the whole six years as well mm. yeah so you got plenty of time to think of it in the yeah. six and a half years to <laughs> <laughs> whether it's for yeah, you yeah that's right yeah um ethan and i we're speaking earlier. Well, it's really cool that you're well supported. That's always, it's really nice, always really nice to hear. Um, but we're talking about things that we could ask you. Um, and do you want to start with the question that you asked? Me? I guess if you if you were pope for a day, yeah, here we go. And there's, there's, I think there's no doubt that this day and age, the. Um, there's much less people worshipping um, in all religions. Actually, I, I don't know about that, but definitely in Catholic Church for, for various reasons. 
Yeah, is there anything? Latest, oh, just to interrupt, I think yeah. latest census stats in Australia was um, just was it just over fifty percent? Only like fifty three percent or something. Um, yeah, recognised as uh, Catholic. Yeah, 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 Catholic, something like that. And that's to me that sounds high, even. Yeah, uh, just in the circles that I um, deal in. So you pope for a day. Yep. Is there anything to the top of the head you can think of to try and not to get more people to go to church? Because that's not why. That's not what you're about. It's not about trying to get more people. It's about trying to help as many people as you can, and you spread the word and and all that. Is there anything you can think of that you would do to to help that? One one that jumped in my mind was, and it goes probably counter to everything priests stand for is if they were able to have families. Ah, right. Because I know in the Anglican Church you can. Yes. And that's, I think, a big draw card for a lot of potential priests is that you can still have that and also give back in the priest capacity. Mm. Is there anything you can think of? To what bring more people to the church? I think... I I feel like there's two questions there. There's like... What do you think? And there's also addressing, you know, should priests be able to be married and that sort of thing. If we, if we put the marriage aside, okay. firstly, just what do you think? Yeah. Is there anything you think the church can do to? So there's this, um, I, I get, maybe not a new study, but there's this um, research that's been done on parishes and churches and stuff. And the previous model which worked because it was the society and culture at that time was you needed to um you needed to uh, believe first um and then that meant that you behaved in a certain way and then that meant that so if you you know you believe so then that meant that you go to church and that meant that you belong but now it's it's sort of like a triangle but if you invert the triangle or invert the funnel it's more like we need people to feel like they belong first and i think that's what other christian churches do well and maybe the catholic church doesn't do as well um is sort of make people feel like they belong so instead of just saying look come to church go to the sacraments it's more like hey we're all part of one family um would you like to come to this cool barbecue thing make them feel like they belong make them feel like they are part of a community um make them feel you know love which is ultimately from god and then then they might you know behave in a certain way then they might believe eventually but first of all we just need to make make better community and help people uh, belong more and maybe invert the pyramid so um, a good phrase is if we do what we've always done then we'll get what we've always got but you know we can't just act as business as usual like the church is dwindling um, yeah people are be- believing less that sort of thing um, so we just can't act like we used to do we have to think of new ways um, yeah, going in, into social media realm, um, yeah, that sort, sort of, of thing. adapt to the new, yeah, uh, the new world. So, on that, I think you're saying it, it, to be a good Catholic doesn't mean just going to church. It's establishing yeah. that community, making people, yeah. as you say, act a certain way, believe, and then once they feel a part of that, then the church numbers will hopefully um, yes increase. Yeah, I like that. That's yeah. a good thing. I think that's really good. You should be Pope. <laughs> <laughs> and ultimately, it's about relationships as well. So, mm. yeah, yeah, you're not going to, you're less likely to go to church if it's just out of obligation. Oh, you're going to go to hell if you don't go to church. No, it's more about relationship, relationship with other people, relationship with your pastor, with your priest, relationship with God, and then goes from there. Yeah. So instead of ostracizing people who are doing bad things or not doing certain things, yeah. may, leading them on the journey to, I guess the end point, not expecting them to start there and work their way backwards. That's exactly. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, accompanying people, journeying with them and meeting them where they're at. So you don't just open the doors of the church and expect people to flood in. No, it's like, you know, going outside the church and inviting people into the church or inviting people to a barbecue or inviting people to this or that. Yeah. So then I guess that leads on to when with the church... 
like Ethan just suggested maybe like priests having families and all and maybe being that's, a that's bit more, radical not gonna happen yeah yeah oh, like example. what I'm saying is do you think that um some of those old things should change over time or do you think that the rig- the rigidity rigidity rigid being rigid is yeah. what keeps everything together yeah well um how do I put it like there's yeah tradition which is I don't know it's been thought like the rules and regulations are not just a random thing that some old guy thought of and then it's now set in stone mm. there's been a lot of thought that goes into it, a lot of people that have you know met over the things and, and talked about it so Vatican 1 Vatican 2 yeah that's right yeah. so big big councils of people talk about these things and decide on decisions um, and they ultimately have a reason and a, and a, a why to to their existence um, so you know, they, they they jokingly say it for the church to make a quick decision takes fifty years, and for the church to make a big decision takes like centuries, <laughs> um, yep. which is kind of true um, because it's just like sort of moving a big big boat. You need to like slowly steer it, and one implication here uh, means that it goes out to the whole world, sort of thing. Um, so it it's not something to take lightly, but. Yeah, there is always open room to, you know, room for change. And, and that's what church is. Church is not like a stagnant thing. The church is, you know, alive and active and, and we're supposed to change as the world changes as well. And, you know, like there's nothing in <laughs> scripture about social media or yeah. uh, driving cars or whatever. Um, but those things exist now. And so we have to, you know figure out how to act in a world that has that um, and that's what those councils are that's what those rules are etc cetera, etc cetera. because you see in the states they've got all those you know they fill out like a football stadium 80,000 people happy clappy and all that and I, I have no problem with that because at the end of the day religion is for yourself and how you you know whether you want to pray at home whether you want to pray at church or in a stadium mm. if you're living that life and you're doing the right thing then great for them and they're having, I think they've got great numbers um, in terms of um, fellowship in the States. So I think that's probably yeah, exactly what you're saying. Maybe things need to become the 21st century, 22nd century. What are we now? Yeah. Um, one of them. One of them. So what are the last thing before we do a little bit of a rapid fire, Gerard? Oh, let's go. Yeah. Um, back to the, the podcast, the theme of, of being Asian. So I'm, I'm grossly stereotyping here, but typical Asians it's about the family growing the family succession you know financial freedom all these things you as a priest you have to kiss all that goodbye and you know that yeah um has that (laughs) has that ever factored into your decision knowing that that's the the sacrifice that you're gonna have to make yeah probably initially it definitely was there but I feel like it's a smaller sacrifice for a greater yes like you're doing God's work and God will help you through that. There's a there's a parable in the Bible called the parable of the treasure in the field. And I feel like I'm the guy that's found this treasure in the field randomly, but it's vacant land. So I put it back and then sold all my possessions, um, bought the field with the treasure in it. And now I have, you know, this treasure that's... Um, what do you call it? Priceless. So yep. similar, like I've just given up everything and maybe like the worldly stuff doesn't really matter to me as much because, um, you know, try to put the order, um, yeah, get the right different order. Different priority. Yeah, priority. In your life. Yeah. Well, Sam is the par- parable of the uh, prodigal son. So let's get into rapid fire. All right. Um, <laughs> thanks, rapid, thanks for that, Charlie. Yeah, no worries. Um, rapid fire is just a quick question, whatever, the first thing that pops to your mind, just answer um do you prefer texting or calling texting summer or winter winter what's your favorite city in the whole world or australia whole world mexico is nice well, it's a good city nice um japanese or korean food korean oh, My that's man. the first one <laughs> um 
the TV show Friends or How I Met Your Mother? Friends. Sunrise or Sunset? Sunrise. Reality shows or documentaries? Probably docos. And would you have the ability to pause time or rewind time and why? No, I don't want to rewind time. Yeah, probably just pause time. <laughs> Ooh, why not rewind time? Because then you just see your mistakes and just go. I don't want to live in the past. It's kind of kind of sad. That's good. That's nice. <laughs> just live. It's, in the it's kind of a like a, it's meant to be a psychological question. So, yeah. are you content with yourself now? So you'd pause uh, it. You'd live in this moment, or do you want to? Do you have regrets? Do you want to go over it again and uh, yeah, rewind? No, I don't it? have much many regrets. Yeah, I, I love life. So probably pause time and enjoy the moment. That's it, man. So you're, you say you're about 14 months away from becoming a priest. Um, what's the journey from now till then? What do I have to do? So I have to do a master's in theology. I've got my last semester ahead of me. Uh, my thesis is 12,000 words. It's about suffering. Uh, it's about, yeah, so I get, to do, I get to do prac while I'm um, doing theory as well. So suffering through the study of suffering. Um, it's about... <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's kind of sadistic, but yeah. Um, no, it's very interesting. It's about uh, redemptive suffering. So how God redeems suffering. Like he was a perfect guy, didn't have to suffer. Jesus didn't have to suffer, but he did. So therefore, when we suffer, we can look to his suffering and it has a meaning for us. Um, it gives us hope. It gives us, um, it gives us something to look to to when we are suffering um, because someone has gone before us and did it even though he you know didn't deserve it um, yeah so I, I'm still in I guess the preliminary stages of you know reading and finding um, answers and things like that I won't I can't promise to have some all the answers but I'll have a better idea of it uh, at the end and sure I can so you haven't suffered give yet give it to you <laughs> No, not enough suffering. <laughs> and, and yes, I haven't really started yet, if that's what you're asking. <laughs> Without suffering, then you don't know the good times. So Yeah, that's true. Yep. That's yep. I've always I've always loved to speak to priests and um you know, my parents as well, they're very devout and I've always asked them from a young age, so you know, there's all the suffering in the world, how is God um, allowing it they said yeah. well without that then you don't know the good times um, you gotta have bad you gotta have the good and mm. without that balance everything's good so is it good yeah. then or is it just normal yeah that's true and um, there's also you know God works through the suffering God allows suffering because then there's you know people in the world to help yeah bring about God's goodness in in the suffering you know create vaccines and um, frontline workers all that stuff yeah so my last thing then, Gerard, and thanks again for your time. Um, any last advice for um, someone in your position? So they're you know, about to finish school, they're sitting on the fence of potentially going down you know, a, a religious route. Any, any last advice that you'd give to them? Yeah, super good question. Uh, first, I, I think there's a few things I'd say. Um, pray, have a... Um, pray which is just you know a relationship get to know jesus either through reading scriptures or journaling or meditation or um praying set prayers like the rosary or whatever um secondly find a mentor find someone that or someone that either has done the journey or knows a bit more about the journey um whether that's a priest or a uh, someone that you look up to or a sort of grandfather figure or something yeah um that you can just, you know, ask a million questions, that sort of thing. Um, and thirdly, yeah, you know, you can't can't do it in a vacuum. So don't just um, think about it by yourself. Make sure you've, you know, tell a few other people or um, find maybe uh, some friends that you can journey on the journey with together. You can go on the journey with together. Yeah, no, that's, that's great advice. And I think... You're, you're an example of someone who's, you know, they've got it all, like I said, full life ahead of them. And, you know, you've got to this point now where you, you're comfortable with the decision and you've um, put yourself in this position. So I think a lot of people can hopefully get strength and inspiration from, from listening to you, hopefully, even if it's just one person. I think that's fine. And thanks again. No worries. Thanks for having me on the show. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. So easy. <laughs>